Okay. All right. Well, let's get started here. And so uh, first thing I want to do is I want to introduce Andrea, but I frankly don't know enough about her to be able to tell you what she does. And when I've asked her in the past a couple of times, what do you do? She rattles off so much stuff so fast that I don't understand any of it. I, Andrea is an expert in what I would call user experience. Now, as soon as she gets into her presentation, she will tell me that what I called it was something completely wrong and she will correct me, I have no doubt. So <laughs> what I want to first, Andrea, is give everybody just a couple seconds of what is your background and why is it that we should listen to you today? Sure, yeah, and thank you, Dan. It, uh, she, it's a work in progress. She's still learning, as Catherine would say. Um, so yes, I, my background is I did... Um, 18 years in corporate America making SaaS products, so software as solution, um, as a user experience researcher and product strategist. So that's my background. I um, also have a PhD in human computer interaction. So I nerd out pretty hard on hardcore on user experience. Um, and I actually have a little bit of like an intro on what is user experience, because I think there's a lot of um, people who maybe don't totally know or they kind of know. And so I, I have a little bit of an intro on that, too. So if you don't know what that is, that's OK. Well, we'll get you taken care of. Well, I didn't even know you had a PhD. So, um, <laughs> what we're going to do here is I think I'm just going to let you go fly through this presentation. Tell us everything we need to know. And then after that, after she's done with the presentation, then I'm going to come back in and we're going to go through a bunch of membership sites because we're doing this specifically on membership sites today, not other sites or anything else. So just specifically in members area, user experience, gamification, that kind of stuff, just to be able to get people to stay and consume your content. So, all right, Andrea, why don't you share your screen and give us what you got? Okay. Sounds good. And you can still hear me. Okay. Um, okay, so my name is Andrea Pierre, and thank you for the introduction. Um, I My movement to try to incorporate some of that language from Catherine is experience crafting. So it's creating transformative experiences. Um, and I can go deeper into what that means, but essentially it's all of us are crazy human brain, eyes, uh, the way that we feel, the way that we sense, all of that. It's a, there's an art and science into how you design a particular technology that takes that into account to try to help to um, insert delight and surprise and just honor our very awesome humanness that gets in the way a lot of times of us actually um, fully engaging in our tech experiences. And like I said, I pretty much geek out on experience. Um, I'm not going to go through this because I just did a second ago, but I've studied it. I've practiced it um, for about 18 years now. And then about two years ago, I started applying it into more of that entrepreneurial space. Um, more specifically, it was in membership sites in ClickFunnels. And I think um, the, just to give kind of a 101 of when I'm talking about user experience, that's the common word for it. Um, I, I will use customer experience and user experience interchangeably. For all the folks out there who know uh, a little bit deeper on what these two things are and the distinction between them, um, DM me, I'll talk further about why I interchange them. But for this presentation, I will use customer experience and user experience interchangeably. Um, okay, so just a level set on like, what is this whole concept of user experience? It, it, this is the coolest part about it. And that is that everywhere that we go in the world, everything that we interact with, it actually is talking to you. Now you might be like, what do you, what do you mean? It is actually talking to you. It's telling you what to do with it in a way that we can understand or in a way that's confusing to us. And it causes us a little bit of work. Either we have to think about it or we get frustrated because it doesn't do what we expect it to do, or we have to like modify our body in order to interact with it. But all of these things that are talking to us, they have the opportunity to speak um, well to us and communicate effectively with us or not. And when it's or not, this actually causes pain because we have to think about it or we have to, you know, like get frustrated or we have to torque our body in weird ways, right? And the funny part about this pain that people experience when they interact with these things is that they actually translate that pain to the product and by proxy, the brand or the company or you being the solopreneur and the brand of your, um, and you are the brand. So let me tell you exactly, let me show you a little bit exactly what this means. 
the most famous reference for user experience is with doors. So you might have seen that funny South Park episode where the little kid is trying to push on the door, but it's like a handle that says to pull. Um, doors talk to us all the time and we interact with doors every day, multiple times a day. So next time you go up to door, ask the question, what is this door telling me to do with it? So in this case, if I'm looking at this door, it obviously the door is telling me to push, but the sign is telling me to pull. So I have to think about it a little bit. It doesn't make too much sense. There's a little bit of a mismatch. It's just a small little frustration. Now you might be asking, okay, so I get a little frustrated or I don't even barely notice it. It's like a miter blip on the radar. But when these start adding up, especially in our the designs that we make in membership sites, we call it death by a thousand cuts. So one might be excusable, two might they get over it, but when you start racking up these little tiny things that cause us to have to think, cause us to have to feel something that we don't want to feel, or that cause us to have to like do something different with our body, it starts to tally up and ultimately people will abandon it. They'll leave because um, their tolerance for that kind of thing is low. Now, let me show you what this means in the actual web world. So when I'm in a web world, all of us know what this means, right? But it's just right now, text on the screen. I can improve the way that this tells, that this talks to me as a customer, as a user, by doing simple things like this. Ah, okay, I know what that means. That looks like a button. So I know I can push buttons, right? Or I can even increase it a little bit more by adding a little bit of shadowing, which now looks like I can actually press it, which I know that's what I can do with buttons. And so this is just one example of how we can improve some of those, you, the, the elements on the screen in order to help fit with the way that our brains and our eyes and our, our, our body wants to work. So basically what I'm saying is imagine this, here's you. Here's one of your humans that you wanna serve. And right now, when you're building your membership site, you are trying to talk to your humans through a computer interface. And a lot of times I think we forget this because we're so busy trying to figure out the technology that we forget that on the other end, there's a human who, if we were just talking to that human, it'd be so much easier. We could just tell them or show them or point in the direction or guide them. But because we don't have any of those in-person real-time things, we have to use some of these principles in order to help make that communication really successful. Um, there was a video that I was going to show, and I'll just have to put the link in the replay. Um, we tested it out right before this, and it wasn't going to work. So I'll explain what happens. So if anybody who hasn't seen this video, it's hilarious. Imagine that Google Analytics was a person. This cashier is the personification of Google Analytics. Like if Google Analytics was a person, this person is acting like Google Analytics. And the other guy is just a customer. and He just wants to use Google Analytics, right? In this case, he just wants to buy a loaf of bread. So this whole situation is trying to say, okay, what if Google Analytics were a person and the conversation was happening? So the gentleman's coming up. He just wants to purchase a, a loaf of bread. And the cashier goes through this whole sequence of events. Like, what's your username? What's your password? Nope, I'm sorry. That's not right. He's like, I just want to buy a piece of bread. I need your password in order to proceed. And the whole parody goes on and on and on. Eventually, the guy's finally ready to pay. And the cashier holds up one of those little CAPTA signs to make sure, like, I need to make sure that you're a real person what does this say? And the guy who's trying to buy the bread is like, I don't know. I don't read that. He's like, what does this say? And he eventually like, like tries to get it out. And the guy's like, okay. And then he times out and the guy has to wake him back up again. So anyway, it goes on. But the point of this is that a lot of times when we develop these technologies, we forget that we're actually talking to real people on the other end. And we start to use some of this like computer language. And then it just kind of gets degraded. And the human on the other end has to try to figure it out. And we lose our message and we lose our audience when those things happen. So when you think about uh, user experience, it basically is a strategy and a process and tools and techniques that make sure that that communication that you're wanting to have with your humans goes the way that you want it to go, how you want it to go in a way that honors you and your brand. And so we're going to dive into some of those principles now. And let me just do a quick check. Um, Dan, are you still hearing me okay? I'm oh yeah, I'm hearing you just better. fine. And I was just going to jump in here and just give you a real, a real life example that I ran yeah. through just recently. I won't use any names or anything, but there was um, a software package that I wanted to purchase 
And at first I was going to buy it. And then I didn't have the money at the time. And then I did end up buying it. It was more expensive, but part of the rules of the game changed right as I was getting in and I'm like going, okay, well, all right, I can still make it work even with those rule changes. And then something else really huge happened. And then another big thing, and I'm being really vague here. So people don't know what I'm talking about, but then I start working in the software and the software first off, it doesn't do the one thing I really wanted it to do. And they're like, okay, well, we'll fix that. Is that okay? And I'm like, okay, all right, fine. And then there was like another thing. And by the third or fourth, I mean, by the time there was like six things, yeah, I finally just said, I'm done. Yeah. I'm out. Yeah. I'm not paying money for what eventually became not even close to what I was originally sold a month earlier. Now here I am a month or two into this thing and I'm not getting even close to the product that I was told I was going to get. Yep. And so this exact same thing on a website, you go into a website and you click on a button and it doesn't work. And then you do something else and it doesn't work. And you know, it's real easy to click away from a website. Yes. It's a lot easier than what I had to do to separate myself from this thing. But it's just, yeah, I mean, we see, we all have those frustrations in our lives and eventually we just have to go, I'm done and you walk away. Well, yep. walking away from websites is real easy. Yep. yep. You hit click. Yep. And so that's why you got to make sure your stuff is working so that you keep the people there. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Well said. Yeah. It's a perfect example. And I would say that you're somebody who probably has a higher than normal tolerance for tech issues, right? I think that um, if you think about it, about 95% of the population, um, there's a lot of anxiety around using technology because they've been beat up by it so much. And for whatever reason, we think it's our fault as customers (laughs) that the technology is not working. We think we're dumb that we don't know it, or we haven't figured it out. But in reality, it just hasn't been designed well. And so I think there's this, um, this very quick, like abandon, right? Not just cause like I'm fed up, but because I feel like crap trying to figure this out and I don't want to feel like crap. <laughs> well, especially if you think you're getting spammed or something yeah. else bad is going to happen while you're on that site. Could you pull your mic a little bit closer to your mouth again? I'm, I'm, the volume is definitely going down. Okay. Is that okay. better? Yeah. Okay, cool. I wonder too, let me, does that help? Yeah, probably. You don't okay. really need that pop filter on there. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, cool. Great example. Um, okay. So, and I'm just looking at the comments really quick. Awesome. So I'm going to go a little bit, uh, into the elements of user experience and I'll say, this is probably the most famous picture of the elements of user experience. And I can, of course, could talk for so long and nerd out on this for so long, but today I'm just going to focus on the product aspects of user experience. Um, and give you a high level what they are and then try to give you just a handful of principles that you could think of as you're looking at your membership sites. And we're gonna have some membership site examples um, to really drive this home. So the first one is the visual design layer. To be honest, I am not a visual designer. Um, I I know the principles and I know what I need to be doing, but I uh, do not have that beautiful skill set that like Erin does. <laughs> and that's why I'm always watching what she's doing because I and I'm just not a visual designer. So I put her link down below because if you haven't seen her presentation on visual design, I highly recommend you you look at that. It's really good. Um, But in honor of the visual design, normally how I think about it is how the brain and the visual perception system understands visual design or like what it sees on the screen. And so that's what I'm going to share today. So I boil it down to these five design principles that I look at on my any first pass. Um, And so the first one is scale. And just to give a really real world example, I'm going to use the CF design school example because all of us are familiar with that. So when I'm talking about scale, scale is essentially the size of objects tells me the importance of the object. So when I see that join the exclusive 10K club, that text is bigger than how to join. I'm going to immediately in my brain say, oh, okay, joining is really important. And then I'm going to figure out how to join. And so this is a super easy thing that you can do in the visual aspect of your membership sites, just to make sure that the thing that is the most important has usually the biggest size. It's larger than everything else. Um, Now, of course, you don't want everything on your page to be like a million different sizes. I would highly recommend you pick like you know, two or three sizes that you're using, but make sure that the thing that you want them to really pay attention to is the biggest size. So that one's pretty easy one. 
The next one is what I call visual hierarchy. And so what this is, is it is a combination of the things that you want the brain to pay attention to, they have more weight. So usually this means bold or Dan has some really nice hacks on um, how to uh, layer the text so that you can put something behind the text, things like that, that give um, my eye something that pays a little bit more attention to it. It's a little bit more important and then from there, it flows. And so as you can see this red line, it goes from join, and then I see this nice image. And then it gets a little bit bigger, and then a little bit smaller, and then a little bit bigger, and a little bit smaller. So there's a natural flow that's happening as my eye is scanning down the page. And this is what we call the visual hierarchy. So it has this natural rhythm of important, smaller, a little less important, important, smaller, a little less important. Um, this is pretty normal, especially in our web 2.0 world that we live in, where we have these concepts of like header one, header two, header three. It's because of this principle. All right, the third principle is balance. This one is, I think, um, hard in the ClickFunnels membership area. And that's why when most, when I develop uh, or when I design membership sites, I normally use the entire space um, with some of the, you know, the full row width type of code, just so that I can play with the balance a little bit better. Um, if anybody saw, again, Erin's, um, her membership site, it is beautifully balanced, of course. Um, but she really played with that whole space and how to use that whole space. Um, by nature, out of the box, click funnels, you know, you see this line down the middle, which is the, the most, um, the basic way to look at balance is if you put a line down the middle of your screen, just look and see if it's balanced. Now, be, make sure that you know that um, balance does not mean symmetry. You can have asymmetry as long as like the weight on one side or the stuff, the amount of stuff on one side is fairly equivalent to the amount of stuff on the other side. And you can see that ClickFunnels membership out of the box kind of automatically is out of balance. There's things that you can do to compensate for it, which we can talk more about. Um, but this is a general rule of thumb when you're looking at balance um, relative to your membership sites. Um, so tell thing, me to stop you then yeah. for a second. So yeah, yeah. In, in the case of this particular page we're looking at here, mm -hmm. would you, in order to balance this, would you say you just need more stuff on the bottom of the left-hand side or you want to balance them out um, equidistance, you know, horizontally, how would, would you balance a page like this? Yeah, I would. Um, so it would be an asymmetric balance, right? Cause you wouldn't want to just like populate stuff on the left cause it doesn't serve a purpose. But what I may do is the heaviness on the right side. Yeah. I would probably expand with, I would play with the horizontal space. I might make the navigation elements maybe a little bit bigger, um, or even on the right side, the way that you can overcome balance or help with balance is repetition, which is what Catherine did here, which is really nice. And so because of the repetition that I see on the right side with the yellow headers is similar to the yellow headers on the left side, then there's a, a quasi balanced field that is achieved, even though the okay. weight of things are different. Okay. Does that answer your question, Dan? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is also where if you're familiar with grids, uh, grids can be really powerful. And so just, you know, right now I have just a horizontal line, but if you put a grid like the one I have down here on the left and you put that across, again, if you're playing with the full space um, and you basically, the idea with a grid is that you want um, the key focal points at each point in the grid um, and you just want a balance. So you can see the woman down there on the left, it's an asymmetric balance, but you kind of on the bottom uh, right and the top left, there's there's this um, angle, right? So there's this weighted balance, um, even though it's asymmetric. All right, let me go to contrast because um, this one is why using the color elements can improve the customer experience. And so let me explain. So when we see contrast, our brain thinks that it is different. So that's why when you're thinking about like a call to action buttons, you want to make sure that those are very distinct colors and you don't have anything else that is of that color because then the brain says, ah, that's my call to action button. It's a different color. It looks different. It feels different. So I know that I can do something with it. So that contrast is really important for the brain to say, oh, something's different about it. Um, the other thing that I can say and why I said the navigation, and this is actually, I think Dan will, uh, you have one of these, you, you use this a lot really well. And that is 
when you are active in the nav element, if the color is slightly different for the active nav, it that contrast difference tells my brain, ah, I'm paying attention. I'm paying attention to this thing that's different. And so it helps me orient to where I'm at because I'm paying attention to the contrast difference. Okay. That's why changing that color for the active nav is so important from a brain perspective. All right, the last principle for the visual element is Gestalt. Now I could go really deep on Gestalt. I, I love Gestalt because this is where you can like um, play with the mind and the perception system <laughs> um, if we really want to get you know super cool about it. But um, the, I think the most important Gestalt principle is one of spacing. So when we look at the swipes model, right? And S, the last one is spacing. This to me is where you would put the most emphasis. So this is where I would recommend a change in the ClickFunnels Design School. Now, again, does it make or break the experience? No, but it's just one of those little tiny cuts. And so here you can see that the spacing is almost the exact same between the earn challenge one badge and install click funnels which those things should go together sorry cat um <laughs> those things should go together versus you can see it's almost the exact same spacing between the post picture of you and the earn challenge two right. so to the brain so what you're saying is you yeah. should have more space above earn challenge two to separate that out more Yes, exactly. And, or I would close the space between the first bullet and the header. That's what I would do. Because then what about, it says, putting, what about things... putting a horizontal line under the last bullet on challenge one? Um, you could do that. The problem with that is that a horizontal line increases the, um, like, I'm going to pay attention to it, right? So it, we call it, it increases the cognitive load of the stuff I have to process. And so okay. if I can, okay. if I can overcome, you know, making these things connected via spacing versus putting another visual element on there, um, I would, I would opt for spacing over visual element. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Um, the, I will say that the bar or the, the line is really good when I want to make sure that the brain knows these are clearly separated. Okay. So like if we look at CF design school, right, like there is a gray box around each of the activity elements. That's actually a really good use of the gestalt to say these things are bounded by the same thing. So therefore they go together. Okay. So basically stops the brain at that point. It's kind of mm -hmm. like hitting a wall. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yep, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Um, all right, so let me, okay. All right, so the next one is the information design. And let me just pause there. Any questions on that, Dan, uh, before I, I go on to the next No, and what I was going to say is when you first started this, uh, was is basically yeah, what you said is that this is swipes. This is your color. This is your spacing. This is the design of it, more or less. Yeah, yep, that's a, yep, that's a really good observation. Yep. And it's just knowing those brain principles applied to the membership area. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. The next one is information design. Um, basically information design. This is honestly, when I work with people to develop membership sites, this is where I spend the majority of my time in the design process because um, essentially what this says is that you have all your humans over there and they have their own jargon. They have their own words. They have their own understanding of the world. They don't understand your words. They don't understand your content and they have the context in which they're trying to apply it. And then over on the other side of the bridge is you with all of your knowledge and your information and what you're trying to communicate to them. And this is the, the principles of information design is about how do you actually present those in a way that the brain can understand it. Right. So a lot of times um, this boils down to these four main principles, accessibility. Is it relevant? Can I understand it? And is it usable? And I'm going to show you exactly what those mean. I'm going to use the one funnel away challenge for this one, because I think it does of all the membership sites I've ever um, been a part of. Uh, this one has done the best in terms of that accessibility factor, because this one takes a little bit more effort. So what accessibility is, is that I can access this same information in multiple ways through multiple channels. So in multiple ways means, so Russell Brunson is talking to us about the principles of entrepreneurship and funnels and what to do. And he's doing that via a video. And he also has some visuals that he does his whiteboard, his common whiteboard thing, right? Then he also gives us the same information recorded in an audio form. 
And then the same video is put into a video Facebook so I can access it via my mobile phone. I can plug it into my car on the way. And he gives us a workbook, which is the same information presented in a slightly different way. Plus all of his coaches come on for videos and says the same thing in a slightly different way. And they do this really cool thing where they actually capture the notes of all of the videos and they put it into visual format like you can see down in the bottom right. This is probably one of the best examples that I've seen of presenting the same information in multiple different ways, visual, audio, video, summarized, and in many different channels, a physical book, an audio file, a mobile experience, a desktop experience, and the notes. Um, and again, this just takes, I think, more effort and more work when people are developing. And it's really important when you especially are trying to develop a learning experience. But this is by far one of the best examples of access accessible, making your information really accessible that I've seen. Yeah, I've often heard it called mode or modality or something mm -hmm. like that. Just, you know, or even just repurposing content. Yeah. So yeah. You, you, you take your you take your video, you strip off the audio, you turn it into a PDF. And, and that kind of stuff. Yes. Yep, exactly. One thing that I didn't put on here that I think is really important to mention, especially in the state of the union of what's happening with uh, web design around um, accessibility for maybe like people who might be colorblind or vision impaired or low vision um, is don't ever use color as your primary way to communicate that something is happening. So make sure that if you're, if you're showing something is happening, make sure that you're also using something other than just color. So like, for instance, if you have something that like turns red or turns green, and that's the only way that somebody knows that something, a state has changed, that would be a really bad use of accessibility. Instead, maybe change the words on the button too, right? So make it green and say on, or make it red and say off. So use two modes to be able to communicate information-wise that that's happening. Um, and okay. don't rely on color alone. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's all Americans with Disabilities Act yeah. stuff. And yeah. this, this is not the place to get into that because that's no. another <laughs> huge subject on its own. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. This is probably one of my favorite principles. And this is again, where I spent of all of the principles, this is the one that I spend the absolute most time on. And I think this is the one where gamification comes in. Um, I didn't, I went pretty light on gamification for today's pr presentation, Dan, but I'd be happy okay. to go to it in the future. Um, but this is where it comes in. So relevant in terms of the information is that you're presenting the information in the right way at the right time to the, you know, to, to the right um, state of person. And what I mean by that is, again, One Funnel Away does a really nice job of when I first entered into One Funnel Away, um, the basic premise of any good gamification type of um, experience is that when I'm a rookie, when I'm a novice, when I'm just beginning, it is high structure, low choice. So tell me exactly what I want to do. Talk to me like I know nothing and do not give me a lot of choices. Just, you know, put me on track. Then as I start to gain mastery, that's when you can start to give me more choices and release some of that structure. But it, the, the process that I go about doing it is that there's key moments at which I then gain more ability to, to choose my path. Additionally, the little chunks of information, especially in the One Funnel Away Challenge, I could not get to step two until the next day. So each one of those little blocks, one, two, three, four, I only could access them one day at a time. So day one, I only had access to day one. On day two, I had access to day one and two. And so it was this beautiful example of only give me the information that I can handle in the way that I can handle it at the right time. Um, the, this again, I think is probably one of the, the hardest parts when people are creating membership sites because they just want to like, here's all my information, information vomit, you know, and they don't help a person actually know how to navigate the information. Like what should I consume in what order to what degree? Well, I think it's kind of like the, uh, the equivalent of teaching a kindergarten or calculus. Yes. Yes. You know, they, you know, you start in kindergarten with learning how to pick up sticks and count the number of sticks you have in your hand. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you don't do differential equations when you're in kindergarten. It takes a while to get to that point. And exactly. so you have to add on one thing upon one thing upon one thing. And not only to grow their knowledge, but also to grow their confidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, exactly. So well said. The number one reason that people leave membership sites is overwhelm. 
And mm-hmm. overwhelm is usually on this particular topic. It's because it's too much, it's too fast. And they're like, I'm out, I can't do it. I'm not good enough, I can't do it. And they leave. Well, is it so much, uh, is it, do you think it's a feeling of falling behind or just a feeling of I'm too dumb to get this, I'm too dumb to figure this out? I think it's all of that. Um, okay. I think from, a, from you know, our egos say a lot of times the, um, you know, I, I can't, you know, I can't do it. Right. Um, but I think there's also something just in the inherent way that we process information where we, we only can process, especially when it's something new, when we are rookies, when we are novices, we can only process so much information at once, um, in a given time span. And so if it's like, you know, everybody always jokes about the fire hydrant, but in reality, that's, usually time usually counterproductive to learning it's not a it's not a good thing um unless you take people through like i'm gonna fire hose you but then i'm gonna back off and walk you through step by step well i think also part of it is on the user it's not all on the producer a lot of it's on the user that they try to cram all this stuff in they they think it's you know college and they're gonna they're gonna cram for the exam the next day well we all know that you don't learn anything long term by doing that and you just kind of burn yourself up Yep, exactly. And so, okay, I got to learn all, you know, so it'd be like somebody coming into Catherine's course and going, okay, I'm going to finish all this in a, in a week. Yeah. Can somebody do it? Maybe. Um, but you may also burn yourself up in the process. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's a, it's an interesting point that you raise, especially in Catherine's, because I mean, we could, we can come in here and we can go to anywhere and do anything. Right. But the inherent nature of her course is it, it highly suggests that we follow this path of like challenge one, challenge two, challenge three, right? Right. To build our knowledge. Um, And so it's just, it's almost inherent in the design that it supports that, that growth path. Yeah. Um, Okay. The next one is understandable in terms of information. This one's really easy. It's just, it's that jargon thing um, and ease me into terms. I use the Hemingway editor all the time whenever I'm looking at content um, to make sure that I'm, you know, targeting that like fourth grade to eighth grade level, depending on my client. Um, And the Hemingway editor is just, and it's an amazing tool. You can download it on your computer. It's, it's awesome. It just insert a chunk of text and, and it'll give you a lot of great feedback on how to make it more accessible. Yeah. Um, I used to use it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. Um, The other thing that I'll note here in terms of understandable is I want you to note on um, the one funnel away um, the, the language that they use, even when they do add a jargon word, so like hacking, for instance, right? That's a jargon word to somebody who doesn't understand one funnel away, but they've done a lot of things to surround it by words I understand. So my brain can kind of make the leap, right? Like offer. Okay. I think I know what an offer is. I don't know what hacking is, but I'm good to keep going. Cause I kind of understand. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, or it's showing the visual in the um, the YouTube video to kind of give me a little bit of a, my brain, a clue. I'm like, okay, what are we going to be learning about? Right. And so it's, it's a nice jump for me to think that this is understandable, even if I don't fully understand all the words on the screen. Well, yeah. And when you throw a word out there like hacking, but then you spend the next 10 minutes explaining what hacking means, that's obviously what you need to do so that somebody can walk away and have an understanding. Okay. Well, offer hacking means I'm going out and finding other people's offers, just like design hacking or anything else. I'm going out and finding people's offers and I'm going, okay, what is it about this offer that works? Why did they offer these three bonuses on top of their core product? What was the purpose of that? How did that deal with my, my vehicle, internal, external, uh, false beliefs? Yeah. And that's, that's what it's really all about. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Um, all right. The, the last principle on information is usable. So we look, we looked at what usable means from a, the visual perspective, but this is from a content perspective. So is the content usable? And what I mean by that is usually it boils down to labels and the navigation system. And can I apply it immediately? So I'm going to point out in the one funnel away, if you'll notice over on the left navigation, do you see this numbering schema W1 slash M1 colon offer hacking. And then right there in the header is W1 M1 offer hacking. Really nice connection for me to know that the information is related. And I know that it's week one, mission one offer hacking. And I know that because of the very first section, it oriented me to the labeling and the navigation system in the membership area. So it allowed my brain to say, okay, I know how this thing works. So now I can actually focus on the learning. 
So my question would be on a header like this, where it says W one M one, would they be better off saying week one module one and typing it out in full up there? I personally would. Yes. Um, okay. I think they explained it in the secret mission area. And so that allowed me to understand it. But if I didn't have to like take time to listen to that and I could just visually see it instead, that is a better alternative. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I get to do it in the sidebar cause you're kind of limited. I mean, unless you want to go to a second line in your text, but otherwise you're kind of limited over there, but then to spell it out in full at the top of each one of the lessons. What I might do, and it might feel like overkill, um, to exactly to your point, Dan, of I, the, I guarantee you're right. The reason they did the W1M1 is to shorten it in the left nav. What I would do is I would keep it in the header, but right under, like right above it in smaller letters, I would write out week one, mission one. So it's crystal, crystal clear. Nobody could forget that. Nobody can miss that. Right. Yeah. Cool. All right, so that is information design. All right, so I just have one more element and then we get to go into all of the rich goodies of the membership interaction. How are we doing, Dan, on comments or? Um, yeah, I'm watching it on my phone here. Everybody, we got, uh, well, we got like seven people still on. So, uh, cool. you know, either way, like I said to everybody, in case you missed it, there will be a recording and it will be put into the group. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, so this is uh, the interactive layer. This is where it was really hard for me to skinny down because this is where my majority of my expertise comes in. Um, and this is where I spent a lot of my career is in this area. Um, I This is where I super nerd out. So, but I labeled it to six, six principles. And okay. I'm going to go through what this means. And I'm going to talk about the CF Ninja Hacks as an example, because I think it's one of the best examples. Okay. All right. So the first one, the first principle is the visibility of the system. Dan, I think you probably are the person who does this the best, to be honest. Um, and that is when I, and I'm going to actually show it because when you talk interaction, you actually have to show stuff because um, it, it, it's the, it's the movement of the thing. That's the important part. Okay. So when I am in CF Ninja Hacks, um, and again, the principle is visibility of the system. So what that means is as a, um, as a user or a customer, I want to know, like, what is the system doing so I know how to interact with it? Remember, everything talks to us. Everything tells us what to do with it. So if I'm looking over here at your navigation, it is really clear where I'm at in this navigation. When I hover, there's an action, meaning like, okay, the, the color changes there on the hover action. So the change, even though it is color, but the change of it tells my brain, oh, I can do something with this thing, right? And the fact that you have an indention also gives me a clear, okay, this is where I'm at in the world. And the fact that you have this really nice line around it tells my brain, this is the active member area. So this is where I'm at in the world. So those three elements alone tell me that the system is telling me I am in this intro to Hacks 101, watch this first. Um, it's a really nice demonstration of the system telling me what it's doing. The other thing that you do really well, um, and I wonder if I could log out and come back in, is uh, you're the only one that does this, but on the load, um, when you do your little loading thing, um, that is another perfect example of the system telling me what it's doing. Oh, it's loading. So I'm not just sitting here looking at a blank screen, right? So super nice um, the, that it's telling me what it's doing. Now here, the only thing I would say is just keep your processing um, language potentially. But other than that, it's a really nice system feedback to say, hey, I'm working. I'm doing something. Don't worry. It's coming. Um, the next one, the next principle is the match between the system and the real world. This one's hard uh, to, to um, demonstrate, but I think the best example I could find that you have in the CF Ninja Hacks is the images that you use are the thing that my brain would expect in the real world. So like, even though these are just images of a video and a little play sign, the, they're not actually a video, right? Like they're just an image, but my brain actually, says, I think, oh. I think they're pop-ups. I think they're video yeah. pops. Yeah, they are. Okay. Um, but the, the image itself tells my brain, oh, that's a video, right? The little play icon. I understand that to be a video. That's what I know in the real world or like outside this world. And so you're using my connection of like, I know what that thing means. So I, I don't even have to read the text. I know what that thing is. It's a really good demonstration of that matching. Um, the other, the most popular example of this is like when you use icons that uh, tell you what it does. So like the trash icon, all of us know what that is, right. right? They're just like universal icons that help the brain know, okay, I've seen this in the real world. So I know this is what I can do with this thing. Right. Or the email envelope yep. or Facebook, yes. Twitter, yes. et cetera. Yes, exactly. Yep. Those are perfect examples. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. 
Um, the next one is user control. Okay, this one, I think the best example of user control meaning do not take control away from the user. And this one's really hard. And Dan, I'm sure after today, you're gonna be like, I know how to do that. Um, in the membership area, the number one place where user control is taken is in transitions. And what I mean by that is, um, let me show you. So you have the awesome, um, I'm down here, right? And it jumps to the top of the screen. Now that transition was actually uh, better than the one I do in mine, because um, mine is super fast. So even okay. that, like slowing it down a little bit, which I know sounds crazy, because it's like, why would I slow that down? People are going to get annoyed. But what that does is it tells me like, I'm still in control of this thing. It's not just jumping on me without me wanting to jump, right? But it tells me like, oh, okay, there's a transition that happened because of my click event. And then right. it's up there. Well, and that's um, one of the things that always bothered me. And that's why I do the slow scrolls like that is because you can be on some websites and you'll click on something and all of a sudden it'll just something brand new will appear. And you're like, am I on the, still on the same page? Yes. Where did I go? How did I get here? Whereas if you click on something and a slow scrolls down over half a second, you, you saw that visual trend transition to now where you are. So you, you, you haven't lost it there at that point. Yes, exactly. Yep, exactly. Those transitions are usually the number one place where people feel like they've lost control. And so to really focus on those transitions is key to, to nail this principle. Okay. Yeah, nice. Um, okay, the next one is consistency and standards. Okay, so I'm gonna do an iPhone one just to break a little bit um, because I think this is the one that all of us can relate to. All right, so anybody who first started with an iPhone, all you had to do was ask somebody, how do you delete an app? 90% of people had no idea because there was no consistency in this whole thing of like, I have to click and press and hold. And then all of a sudden they jiggle and now I can delete it, right? Apple basically created that standard. Nowhere else did it really exist. And so for the longest time and still to this day with some of the latest iPhones, they realized that people weren't getting it. So now what they've done is if you hold just a little bit, just extended by like a second, now they have this new thing where it's like, they actually are more explicit saying rearrange apps, delete your app, right? But if you keep holding it for the same duration that you called it for the first one, it goes into the jiggly thing and you can delete. So this is a perfect example where Apple basically violated consistency and violated like, that's the way it works, but they're Apple and that's what they do. And so, and they played around with like, hey, will people get it? You know, will it become a consistent standard? Let me show you another one that's really interesting and um, very controversial in the user experience realms. And that is the hamburger, right? So if I were to survey everybody on this call, what do you think the hamburger does? What should it do? I bet you I'd get like five different answers. It's a menu, it's a drawer, it's how you go back to home, it's how you see everything that's available, right? And people are like playing around with this hamburger thing of like, what's the point, what's the purpose? But because it's now an icon that people kind of recognize and they know they can click on it and get more of something or do something with it, like a drawer, we see it actually in the Ignite program. And Dan created, um, I sent him this, the Ignite um, to design hack. And of course, um, I, I hopefully you'll share that here, Dan, but the, he did it. But when you, they, sure enough, you see that little hamburger guy. And what this hamburger does is it opens and closes the drawer for the Ignite program. Um, it is not the standard of the hamburger, but it's a, it's an icon that people kind of recognize that it can do something. And so now they're incorporating it into their membership area, um, which is just fascinating. Um, okay. The, there's two more principles and then we get to all the, and this is air prevention. This one is really hard to explain. Um, this one basically is if a user can't click on something because of a permission or because of something like that, don't show them the thing right now. OTO is probably <laughs> the best example of this. Um, and that is that if a person can actually click on it, that little, um, overlay that it shows for the OTO, um, and then takes them through and have some come back. That's probably the best example of a good use of they, they can't see it, but I can kind of show you that it's behind this thing. And if you just get past this thing, then you can access it. Um, but just making sure that that is there. So basically rule of thumb is if they can't, actually interact with it, don't show it or give them a way that they can interact with it um, and, and help them through that process to then come back. 
Okay. Cause otherwise they're just going to sit there and just yeah. keep clicking on something and it's not going to work. I, yeah. I know I've definitely done that many times on a web page, and you see something to go, well, this is a button I can, I can click on it and yes. no, you can't, it's not yes. really a button or a link yes. or anything else. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Sure. Far way to rage <laughs> for a lot of users. Yeah, and that's what we, again, to bring it back to the beginning, what we're talking about is it's the death by a thousand cuts Yeah. is, you know, one thing after another, after another, after another, and over however long period of time, depends on how deep those cuts are, your person goes away. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And not only do they go away, they go away with not great thoughts about you and your company. That's right. the worst part, yeah. you know? Um, Okay, the last thing, and then we'll get to some examples. And this is another one that I love so much. It's uh, the principle is called recognition over recall. Now, what I mean by that is um, our brains can't handle much in its memory bank, right? Um, we are have our short-term memory really can't hold very much. And so in a design principle, we say, <clears throat> choose recognition over recall. So meaning if I can say something like you have done with your, um, the blueprints where I, I, you give me an icon and text and the process, my brain does not have to work very hard for things that usually my brain might have to work for. So for instance, custom domain, gosh, I think I remember what that is, but I don't really know. Boom. You give this nice little icon. I can, I can recognize it visually and I don't have to put much brain power to it. SMTP, okay, I'm out. I forget entirely what that means, but you give me a beautiful email. So I'm like, oh, okay, good. Whew. All right, that, that's done, right? So it's this combination that you've done in this navigation, which is a great example of recognition of a recall. The other place that I see this that usually gets violated is in hovers. So like if I hover over something and you give me like a lot of information only when I'm hovering, that, in, that, it, that gives me or increases my short-term memory significantly it is like huge cognitive load. And I'm like, oh my God, that's too much. So I highly recommend don't rely on hover text to communicate anything outside of that immediate action. So like you could hover and you could say, click here to go or click here to move, but don't say, if you click here, you're going to get blah, 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 right? Don't okay. do anything outside of the immediate action. Yeah. Okay. So that is, that is, sorry, I went a little bit long, but those are basically the, like, if I were to boil it down, these are the things that would be like my checklist as I'm designing the five design principles, just the scale, the hierarchy, the gestalt, the contrast and balance. You'll have this PowerPoint. I'm happy to share it so you can reference it. The information is that accessibility, the relevant, understandable, usable, and the six design principles um, of the like make sure the system is talking to me. There's a match to the real world. It supports my control, <coughs> it doesn't control away from me. There's some consistency in the standards that you use. Um, you know, don't let me click on something I can't click on or don't show me something I can't click on and then recognition of a recall. Um, and I think now we're gonna go into some examples of membership sites if you're still good to go, Dan, or what do you think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there's no reason to stop the presentation now and leave people hanging. So uh, yeah. we'll just keep going. If they if they need to jump off, that's cool. And um, we'll just again, it'll all be in the uh, it'll all be in the uh, the group um, at some point. They can watch it, fast forward, do whatever they want. So the thing you need to do is, or I need to share my screen, yeah. which will kick you out of sharing your screen. Okay. And. Okay, so um, what I had here, and so Val's asking, um, are we going to show how to do all this stuff? Um, <clears throat> we're not going to show that today for sure. Uh, that's <laughs> that'd be a little too difficult, and there's uh, there's a lot of code involved. So just just know there's a lot of code involved. I will be coming out with a program at some point about membership site stuff, um, and there will be a lot of training on it in there. So. Um, what we're going to do here is so uh, Andrea went through some of these uh, membership sites already, but we're going to go back through them a little bit and just have her again, just real quickly. What does she like about this site? What does she not like about the site? What can be improved from the UX uh, standpoint? Yeah. So, you know, I talked about the CF Design School a little bit already. Um, Catherine, you know, I don't even know if she completely knows that she's nailing all of these amazing design standards. I think it's just like <laughs> her path is just, it blows my mind all the time. It's awesome. Um, but she, so she's done a really nice job of um, when you're, you know, in that navigation area, it has a clear connection to the content area. The use of color in terms of like the visual hierarchy that we talked about is all solid right there. 
the um, information structuring of it is really good in terms of like bigger things that need my attention are bigger or things that need my attention are bigger, things that need my secondary attention are smaller. Um, if you scroll down the way that she has um, bounded it in these boxes to tell right. my brain, hey, this thing is an activity that belongs together, really good. Um, do you see how she uses like even the icon to the left on the button that also gives me multiple points of data to say what I can do with this thing um, and, and indicates like, hey, go, you know, I'm going to go somewhere by the nature of that arrow. Well, and the other thing is you got the yellow bar across the top of each one of these. So you got a gray around it. You got the yellow bar. You got the number one, number two, number three as you go down. And then each one as well has the same separator in here. Yep. So it really draws the eye down to the most important bit of text in here, which is right right there. Yep. So yep. And there's that a clear and pattern. The button is the things that certainly my eye is drawn to. Exactly. And there's a clear pattern. Okay, Lucy my Andrea. All right. Was there anything else you wanted to say about this page? Now, one of the things I will tell people is everybody, again, I, I, I shot a video about this last week. Everybody talks about the badges and stuff. That's a much higher level principle than what we're talking about here today. Today, we're basically talking about what does your page look like? Whereas dealing with the badges, that's about certainly additional functionality that, that takes, like I said, much higher level uh, understanding of code and databases and stuff like that to be able to get into that. It's known as JSON. And, and like I said, that's a much, much higher level uh, training on that. So is there anything else that you wanted to look at in here? Um, I think the uh, one thing is you'll see that she does have an active region for the active nav. I might even make that a little bit more contrasting, but there is a slight um, active indication, which is really nice to tell me where I'm at. Um, and the repetition of the, um, the way it flows down in terms of that hierarchy and then the boxing and the repetition of it also frees my cognitive resources to focus on the content instead of on how to interact with the thing. So that part is also really nice. Well, what I also noticed here, so you got the challenges, and so each one of those has a whole bunch of arrows next to it, and then you got your pre-challenge fuel with all the lines. In a case like this, which you could even come in and just the ones that are the challenges, you could change the background color on those. Yeah. So they would even stand out even more for yeah. people to see which one are the challenges. And yeah. again, as you hover over this, as you showed in CF Ninja Hacks, which we'll show again in a minute, you could have it on hover, change the background color, change the text color all that kind of stuff. It's just, I mean, basically the sky is the limit when it comes to you say, oh, can I do this? And the answer is normally yes. Yeah. It's just a matter of writing the code to make it happen. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Let me see what did I have next here. Um, all right. Here's the one that I actually built. This is the original one that I built for Steve Larson for his affiliate outreach program. So a little over two years ago now, I won't bore you all with the story about that, but basically they reached out and they said, Hey, will you build us a bunch of training? And I said, yeah, sure. And this is just pretty simple, basic one that I built for them. And as you come through here, you're going to notice the content of course is, is not real content, but we did certain things in here. Like obviously the active member nav is now blue and the font is a bigger, larger size font. It turns white, underlined, so you clearly know on each one of these where you're going through here. And then if you got your lesson here, and then we also indented some of the sub lessons to kind of give it, um, I guess, table contents more of a feel like that. Yep. And then again, um, just through an image in here, just because I could, um, mm -hmm. that again, pretty simple thing to do. And um, I don't know if there's a whole lot of other stuff that's that exciting I in here. I think the only thing on here is just maybe some spacing stuff. Again, going back to that last S on the swipes. So the, do you see how there's like a little bit of a padding in between the content area and the nav? Um, I would close that and not have any padding on that. Um, and the reason being just so that the brain connects those two things. I know the cat. Um, and that would be but the if only- But if I connect them together then, um, so you're saying get rid of the, the shadow around here and all that then too? The shadow is, is is okay. It's more of just the, the 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 white space. It's so small, but just that little bit of white space in between the content and the nav. Hmm. Okay. Um, look at that. And then the only other thing too is just the spacing around that image. So if that image is associated with the stuff hmm. below it or the stuff above it is a little unclear because the spacing is the same between the two areas. You say um, this image here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't even remember why I threw that in there. Um, more than anything else. But the one thing here is also as we scroll down, holds you back up to the top. 
Um, I think that's something that's important to have in there. But now my other question for you is, so when this page loads, every one of these sections is open. Mm -hmm. Is that something you would suggest or would you suggest that they all be closed? That's normally how I build them now is I close everything on the way in. Absolutely. Close everything because it goes into the user control. So especially when you're learning something, having a user discover something and be in control of that actually helps in the learning process. And so, yeah, absolutely. I would have everything be closed to start. Now, if somebody comes in here and opens up section two, would you have it automatically close section one? 90% of the time I do. The only time that I don't is if I'm doing like a reference library where the interacting with the other objects, um, I can't tell, I can't, I can't guess what the user is doing, right? Like it might be important for them to see both things at the same time, but in 90% of the website or the membership sites that I build, it's very single focus. Like you're here, you're only focused on the content on the right. It, all the other stuff in the navigation doesn't help me at all for that task. Okay. So well, as we move true, forward, as we move forward, we'll be getting rid of the navigation uh, completely as because you can see all the open tabs I have up here. Um, so then here, basically, it was a redo of this site where I came in and I put in my previous next plug in here. Uh, in case you're wondering, no, this is not Jamie Smith's. I wrote my own. Um, so you can do the previous next. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? The only thing I would recommend is um, I might... Uh, either do one of two things. I would have it both at the top and the bottom because the natural flow is that I am reading the nav, I'm doing the content, I'm down at the bottom, now I wanna go to the next. And so just having it at the bottom, so it's an immediate. Um, Or the other way that I've seen is the previous is at the top and the next is at the bottom. So it's almost telling me like, okay, I can go back through the previous or I can go forward through the next as I flow through. Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, that's simple enough to put it in both places. It's, it's not a big deal. And again here, so slightly different hover on these things. Again, it turns blue and uh, whatnot. I don't think we had, I don't think there was a hover color. Okay. There was a hover color there. Okay. And then here I just, just for fun, I just made this image change out just because I could. Now here, uh, what I did is I built in additional drawers basically. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, I think that's great. I think the only thing is, okay, so the education-based marketing, is it expanded right now or is it collapsed? Oh, right there. Yeah. I might just play around with how do you, um, go ahead and expand it again. It um, is expanded. Okay. Mm, yeah, both, both of them are expanded right now. So now they're, oh, now I they're see. closed. Okay. Yeah. And I think that would probably be, that would be easily learnable. Um, so like the learnability, we didn't talk about it today, but the learnability of that, I would quickly get the point of that. The only other yeah. thing I can think of is maybe to in, indent the becoming an influencer a little bit. So it's really that visual hierarchy of the content is really clear. Okay. Um, what else did I put in here? Okay. Oh, that's right. Yeah, before you said something about, um, yeah, I put this in just before we got started before, just to show people what the, what they call the Wasabi OTO mm-hmm. inside of ClickFunnels does. And so you can restrict this content and you can say, only show this content if somebody has either purchased the product or has a certain tag set. Yeah. And so then when you click on the upgrade here, it will take you to the order page for that product. Now yeah. I'm going to show you as we go forward here, how I have modified that significantly um, to be able to actually we're to the point where we can actually use order forms inside of the membership areas. Uh, and, first of uh, all, I think that's amazing. And second, yeah, because the like here doing that blue on the black is such a it's not contrasting enough that the brain is and the eyes are gonna have a hard time recognizing that. Yeah, um, you'll see in a couple of slides here and a couple of pages later how how I change out what this text is. I love it. Okay. And move, move it into other places. And then here, oh, I had a, another little show hide module I just built in here. Mm-hmm. So, and it just, again, examples of what can be done yeah. is, so you want to open up some content here. You just have them click on that and boom, you can open up and have a video playing right here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right in the sidebar if you wanted to. Got it. Um, and again, the different indenting and, and stuff like that. And I guess, uh, I guess I had a couple down here. I didn't need to put that one in up here. Okay. All right. Let's see. Uh, so we're back to the sea of ninja hacks, which you went through mm-hmm. quite extensively. So again, um, in here, what I did is, so if we're in this first lesson highlights, the, the section above it here in red 
highlights this, you hover over it, it changes the colors. And if you're wondering where I got these colors from, is these are the basic colors that you use inside of a text editor to write code. That's oh, where the idea of these colors came from. And that's where the idea of this, this image up here came makes from sense. as well. That totally yeah. makes sense. Yeah. And um, so, so you saw that. And then of course, indenting again, all those kind of things, close that up. And then down here, this actually all down here is protected by the Wasabi OTO. But what I did is I took off the overlay and I made it so that all these were actually clickable. So people mm -hmm. are going to go through here and think, oh, I have access to this. And every one of these that they click on is going to pull up this ad essentially. So now if they click on this, it will take them to the sales page and they can buy this product. Mm, nice. Yeah, that definitely um, gives the user more control to know, like, instead of, I don't know where I'm going when I click on this upgrade here, right? It gives them more sense of control to say, this is where I'm going to take you. So you can show it first, which is really nice. Yeah. And the other thing I did up here at the top is for all of um, any, any section that you're in, it'll mm -hmm. show right up here at the top, which section you're in. So we come here to choose a funnel template and it will change this out at the top to choose a funnel template as well. Yeah. The and only thing that I training. might recommend is for the areas that are upsell areas. Um, I might recommend some kind of like consistent uh, thing at the top that says like, you don't have access to this, but let me tell you a little bit about what it is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then you can buy it or like available for purchase. Or like I would do something at the top just to make it a distinguishable, oh, this is different. Like I, I have to do something else in order to really get this. Okay. Because on each one of these, they're going to see this page. Um but you're right. It doesn't, it's really not a, a it's not necessarily a call to action in, in the, the fact that people are sitting inside of a membership area and every one of these they click on, they're going to keep seeing the same thing. And without really grabbing their attention and saying, Hey, if you want to buy this, you got to go here. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah you're right. Um, okay. I definitely have to remember that. So now let's go into your ignite just now able to hop on. Yeah, Brooke, there definitely will be a recording in the group. Well, actually, it's going to record straight into the group, so you'll have it there. But as we've been telling everybody, if we crash and burn somewhere in the middle here, which I'm surprised we haven't yet, um, we'll, um, we're, we'll drop the uh, video in the group as well. Uh, okay, so this is one that Andrea came to me, I don't know, a couple months ago now. And uh, as, earlier, she was talking about the hamburger bun. And so the whole idea here, and it's not running quite right yet, because both of these things should slide together. And I have to look at the code and see what I did wrong there. But so you click on it and see something right there, just one went right over the top of the other. It's not supposed to do that. Um, but here you click on it, and it goes back and forth from the three bars to the X. And it doesn't help that we're recording and running Zoom and everything else at the same time. <laughs> but again, we're just using the standard uh, ClickFunnels navigation bar here. All I did essentially is you take this column and you say, okay, start it over here, you know, 800 pixels off the side of the screen and then are 300 pixels, whatever it takes. And you just say, start it over here. And then when you click this button, just have it slide over this way. That's yeah. essentially all it is. It's, it's kind of like a, a hide show function. And I've said this, Andrea, many a times, the majority of what I do whenever I'm building anything, whether it's in a membership site or just on a regular ClickFunnels page, is I use the native ClickFunnels elements as much as I possibly can. And then I basically just move them around on the page. Yep. Hide them, show them, slide them in, uh, you know, whatever it takes. That's it. Was there anything else you want to say about this one? Um, I have two things. First of all, I think, so before I met you, Dan, I did try to get all crazy with the tease was and add all of my own, like um, the, I went to like HTML, um, you know, widget, whatever, or like W3 schools. And I tried to like do all this fancy stuff of like plugging it in, plugging it in, plugging it in. And oh man, there were so many problems with it. And so then when I met you and you were like, no, use all the native elements and you showed me how my websites or my membership sites have gotten a lot better, just easier, cleaner, they load better, all of that. So I can't emphasize that enough. I totally agree. Well, um, I was looking at some training yesterday and Andrea knows who I'm talking about here, but I won't say any names. And this person put out some code hacks and one of them was basically building a, an HTML um, accordion. And there was like 20 lines of code and I looked at that and I built my own and I used two lines of code. And all I said in that code was, is when somebody clicks on this thing, show the other one. And it just, you click on it, the other part slides down, click on it again, slides back up. So two lines of code, if you use native functionality of ClickFunnels, or you can build it all on your own with HTML and you know, 20, 25, 30 lines of code. Plus on top of that, there was probably another 40 lines of CSS code. Whereas I didn't need any CSS code because I built 
everything inside of ClickFunnels. Yeah. So I didn't need any code on top of it. So it's, it's much simpler just to use the native elements. Definitely. And that's what you're going to see here going forward. For the most part is I'm using native elements. So here's a site that, I mean, I'm sorry, did you have anything else here on the Ignite oh, I one? just have one more. And that is, um, this is where ClickFunnels actually violated the hamburger consistency, but I think in a really good way. So you can see you added the X when it was expanded, but we all know that X means close, right? And so it's a really good indicator of like, when I click on that X, it's going to close the drawer and the hamburger is going to open it. So it's a nice communication um, tool that you did there on the iconology. Hmm. Okay. All right. So here is, I'm going to have to reload this page. Everybody cross your fingers. This is normally when bad stuff happens. <laughs> this is the exciting one. <laughs> okay. It's coming. All right. So what we're going to have here is we're going to have a loading screen. At least we should get a loading screen and we're not getting it. Why not? What's going on here? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's okay. Well, if this had loaded right, what you would have seen was my, my ninja guy on the screen and it says loading, uh, it says mission loading at the top. Because one of the problems with these membership sites is they take a while to load, especially you got a lot of videos in them. And so what you want to do is you want to delay when you start showing the content areas, because otherwise they're going to show some content and then other content and it's, it gets all wonky. So you're better off just delaying the load time on it or delaying the time that it displays, I should really say, because it's loading the whole time in the background. And I, I was going to try to click on it again, but let's, let's not waste any more time. But um, so then, then we come to this page and actually where you should land is here. And so again, what I did is here, we're starting to introduce things where we're using other elements in our navigation. So here I'm beginning to use some images in the navigation. And this was something that Andrea was building up for a client of hers. Um, I think it was a client, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so, so here we can use these images to navigate through the content to some degree, but then also I'm still here using the native um, navigation element inside of ClickFunnels. I'm just saying in this case here, when you click on white, just give me the second and third sections of the navigation. Don't show me all of it, just show me these little bits here. And again, all that is use what's built into ClickFunnels and say, okay, show this part, don't show this part, that's all it is. And so, in this case, then you click on this and it will open up the lesson content, which of course we don't have anything built in here. But one of the things that I, uh, I worked on a little bit a couple of weeks ago is we built in a feature here where you can take a quiz. So somebody will click on this here. Let me see if it's working. I don't know if it is or not. Okay. So you go through this quiz and when the student is done with the kid quiz, and this is mostly teaching kids um, karate lessons or something. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, some sort of martial arts. But when they get done with the quiz, that quiz then will, will know whether or not they scored the proper score or not. And what it does is it takes this because it's a Google, it's a Google, um, Google form that we turn into a quiz. It actually sends it to a sheet inside of a Google sheet. Based upon that score, if they got a perfect score, what it does is it sends a tag back to ClickFunnels and opens up the next bit of content. So it's completely automated to be able to have somebody come in, take the test. If they pass the test, it opens up the next content for them. And of course, obviously that's not built into ClickFunnels, but then we had here, um, this part here, I protected with the Wasabi OTO. <laughs> and this is where I was saying that you can come in here and you can change what it says for the content. So I could put a link here, but in this case here, we're not selling anything to anybody. This is all just for the students to go from one level to the next. And it just says, hey, you, you don't have access to this yet. And that's why I built it out like this. Awesome. So anything else you would change on here? Because uh, one of these days, I'm going to give this thing back to you and you're going <laughs> to sell, sell it to your client. One of these days soon. They're ready. They're almost ready. Um, so yeah, I think the only thing I would change is just that that content goes to the top. Um, I haven't quite figured out how to that interaction, but um, just so we can fully use all of that space over on the right side. Um, and I don't know if that means like a collapsing or a hiding of the images above it, you know, or a movement of that left nav, but that's the only thing that I don't have a clear answer for you yet on the interaction elements of it, but that would be the only thing is just the, uh, 
how do we leverage, you know, the full space over on the right side instead of having all the empty space above? Oh, you mean when we come down here? Like yeah. This? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, well, I mean, I could just put this at the top. It doesn't have to sit here. I purposely put it down here at the level of this image. Right. And I think that was the right decision. And so I think if we do move it up the top, we'll have to do something with that first image. The nature of this particular program is that they don't, they most likely won't need to go back to those. Like when you, you start here, the chance of them going back to that is slim to none. And so I'm wondering even if it's like a collapse or something like that, right? Where yeah, we could make, we can make these images up here smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Something like that. That'd yeah. I could even, we could even do that and stack them. So the ones that they've gone through, you could have like one small one here and the, the second one next to it. I love and it. We could do it like that. I yeah. love it. That's awesome. Yeah. That's just, uh, that's yeah. flex, flex box. We could, we could do that. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and you're brilliant. Love okay. It. So let's go into quick start blueprint. You showed this a little bit yeah. as well. Come on. Let me just see if the next one is still visible. Okay. That one's still there. Okay, and that's Catherine's. Okay. All right, it's going to take a little bit to load up here, and I'm I'm completely in the process, starting probably next week, of rebuilding this. I'm going to leave the same basic look and feel, but I'm going to probably reshoot ninety percent of the videos, because first off, I'm just better at a lot of stuff now than I was before, but also a lot of it is outdated. They've made a bunch of changes to ClickFunnels since I shot some of these videos, and just some of it I just it's, it's not needed to be in here. So this is quick start blueprint. And if somebody is just brand new to click funnels and they want to get their stuff set up, they're going to come in here and they're going to go through this training. Mm -hmm. And so as Andrea said before, she wasn't clicking on anything, but you come in here and you click on these icons and, and the whole idea of the icons and everything, of course, came from going through Catherine's course. I never would have thought of using icons before that. But this is a ClickFunnels membership site where we completely did away with the navigation menu and all the navigation is right here. And so how I have this set up is there's only one section in, in the left. Well, there's only one section for all of the lessons. So it's one section in like 10 different lessons. And each lesson is just this here. So you just video on the left. Uh, in fact, let me just show you here. I think I have this open. Um, an open page. So right, right here, we are inside of the editor for the lessons. And so you just lesson here, lesson here, you know, content, whatever here, we got three rows of content. And that's all I did right here was big video on the left. And then I stacked up some elements over here. Now, again, with a little bit of code, I do a little bit of a hide show. So I say, all right, when you click on this, you click on this element right here, show me the video below it. And so the video just, I mean, basically this is an accordion. It doesn't work quite like that, but um, so you click on it and it hides and shows that content. Mm -hmm. So what I'll need to do is change that to a slide down instead of a show. Uh, but that's just, you know, a tiny bit of code, but that's all it says is click on this, which is a headline element and show me this video element. Mm -hmm. And then when you click on the video, it opens it up as a pop-up modal or modal mm -hmm. pop-up or whatever the heck they call them. Video pop-up, I guess is what they call it. And then you yeah. just click on these icons and all these icons do here is say, okay, well, we had been on lesson one, now show me lesson two. Mm -hmm. So put lesson two in here and make lesson one go away. Mm -hmm. So again, we're completely using the native elements built into ClickFunnels. Just, it looks, I'm, I hope it looks a little bit nicer. I think it looks nicer. I, I love the, I love these structures of navs when I, when I get a chance to work in these and it makes sense for the work I'm Okay. All right. Well, we had a technical difficulty there and the video died and I don't remember quite exactly where I was here. So we're just going to move on to the next membership site that we're going to take a look at. And what this is, is I originally built this from the guys who are for the guys who run the Kidpreneur books. And what I did is they had an image that was a table of contents. And so I took that image and I actually made that the navigation. So as you click on the different parts of the image here, it will step you through the different chapters of the book. And you can see here the chapter changes as I go along the top here. Now, obviously I did not build everything out because eventually what happened is guys came to me and they said, 
they wanted something really simple. I thought they wanted something a little cooler. Uh, they wanted something really simple. And it turns out this image over here was the wrong image anyway. So it didn't actually match the product that we were building the membership site for. So I did keep it though as a pretty cool example. Now, uh, in the past, Andrea had seen this. And one of the comments that she made was that to try to highlight the current section or the current chapter you were in a little bit better. And I played around with it. I wasn't really able to come up with much. What else would you see on here would cause us problems, Andrea? Yeah, I think that's really the main one. I mean, first of all, <coughs> it's super fun for a kid. Um, just in terms of like the asymmetrical aspect of it, it, it uh, promotes delight and surprise. And so it's really fun for a kid. Um, the only thing is, even if you can't highlight is like that arrow, because right now it's hard to make the association of where am I at in the table of contents relative to the content that I'm looking on the right. Um, you do have a nice job of the, of the um, text being the same, but I wonder even if maybe the colors could be the same or just something to help the brain make the connection between those two things. Oh, so like the color. So if we're in introduction mm -hmm. to make this color the same, whatever color that is. Yeah. And even like how you have the zero one and like you have zero four, even something like that right next to it, just so the brain is like, oh, okay, that thing is like that thing. So they must be connected. Oh yeah. I think these are the pages in the book is what that was. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. So the color and then, um, or, you know, I could actually take this part of the yes. image and make that the header that would be too that would be good yeah because then again it you know like things go together in the brain okay yeah because this is just um I, I it's been a while since i built this thing i built this probably a year or so ago and um but i'm pretty sure this is just a text element up here at the top and the the text on it swaps mm -hmm. out based upon which uh, chapter, which and I think these are section headers. Um, yeah, they must be section headers. So all I would do here is swap out that section header. And when I swap that out, I can swap out the background image. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, and then would, that would work. Yeah. And then I might make it, see how there's like a paper background behind the image on the left? Um, having it be a paper background on the right too would help make the connection. Hmm. <laughs> so they're not as starkly contrasting. Okay. Yeah, this is like a chalkboard image in the back, but there's so much stuff in front of it, you can't see it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and then I put in the, uh, the navigation yeah, here from chapter to chapter. But yeah, the uh, change that out with an image and stuff, that would definitely work. And yeah. then, okay, so now the next one we're going to take a look at is the one, um, Catherine Jones just came out with this new training area. And so um, I was able to get in, in here, take a look at it. And... I'll, I'll just talk about the things that confused me immediately when I got in here, which was, uh, and part of it is because I know how these things had to be built, is you come down here and you see you got your featured section, and you notice here you got your Funnel Hacking Live video, but then as you come down here further, you get the exact same thing down here. And the same thing, how, how I booked a $92,000 deal, you got the same training when you come down here again. And I was like, why are they doing this? And so they had like the featured, they had the new stuff, they had their bundles. And then finally you get down here where everything is repeated again. So some of these things are on this page three, four times because every one of these here, like you got the insider induction down here. How do I hide this thing down here? Can I? I don't know if it shows up anyway. So, um, and then once you click on one of these here, so let's just click on GCC and then you come here and you get yourself a video. So this here is the actual lesson content itself mm -hmm. right down here at the bottom. And so you got your, your video and then up here they have recently visited. This is like we had said earlier about the badges. This again, this is much higher level stuff. And it involves a JSON database and that kind of stuff. So again, that's not the place for this training right now. But for me overall, I just kind of found it to be confusing because there was so much repetition of the same exact content. So what were your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think, um, so first of all, I want to say that visually it's really stunning. Um, they, I think they've done an amazing job on that front. Um, and we know that when things are really visually stunning, people, their tolerance of maybe potential usability issues is actually really high because they're having such an amazing visual experience. 
Um, typically that wears off after about three months is usually the magic number where the usability aspects of it start to trump the visual appeal of it. Um, so, and I think from a, from a usability standpoint, I, um, I don't know if the repetition is actually that bad. I mean, if you look at Netflix, you'll see a lot of repetition, but it's, it's with a purpose, right? So right now the grouping is we have our featured, we have our new, we have our bundles. So um, the, there's a grouping, right, that's associated with it that I would make a connection to say, oh, okay, this, it's almost like a filter, right? It's acting like a filter. But sometimes headers are, they are missed because the visual, you know, the visual of the visual richness of the things under it trump the header. So if I, I think as this bull area grows, areas that I would probably invest is in what I call wayfinding. So like having a powerful search as a part of it or having a filter, an actual filter system that somebody can interact with would be an important part because um, quickly things are gonna get lost. Um, I think that's why Russell has something similar and that's why they invested all that money in the search, the like sidebar search, where basically they can search inside the content of the videos. Aaron gave that great example of like Searchy, for instance, as an example, um, that will help with some of the soon to be things that might get lost in this amazing area of content. Um, those would be some of the things. Then down below, if you go to the, the very, like the area that I actually interact with, um, I would probably make this a little bit more distinguished, like even just like a line above, like the recently visited, if you, in, if you click on um, design funnels that convert and you right, it, it takes the control away from the user and switches it automatically. So it's not recently visited. It's currently, you know, it's like my current, I'm looking at it right now. And so that's a little bit of a mismatch cognitively of, you know, making the connection between those things. And then um, if you look over on the left too, um, the font is a little bit small, especially for aging populations. Mm -hmm. yeah, I usually try not small. to go, yeah, I try to not go actually below 18 point anymore when I'm making membership sites. Um, mobile's an exception. Um, I might go lower than that on mobile, but I still, just for aging populations, you know, 16 is the absolute lowest I will go. Um, yeah, this is maybe not even 12. Yeah, I'd have to go to my font ninja. Yeah, um, I mean, I could click on it and everything, but we're not going to go into that right now. Yeah. Um, okay, so anything else on here? Because then I have one more thing I have to show yeah. you yeah, that was the secret I didn't tell you about yet. Show me the secret. Okay, um, so hopefully we'll see if this page loads up properly, and we'll go up to the top. So here it is. What I did is I took the idea of what Catherine did here, and I said, okay, well, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it in a simpler way, but also in a way where people always ask, how can you have multiple courses inside of ClickFunnels? Mm -hmm. And essentially, that's what I just built, is nice. having multiple courses inside of ClickFunnels. It's not, but it is. So, um, And how you can protect this then is through the Wasabi OTO. So let me just show you here. So here would be, again, a loading screen. Okay. And what I want it to do is once it's done loading, it's going to start to scroll up. And you can see here then as this scrolls up, I turn this bar at the top black, but I leave it there yeah, the whole time. So you always have access to courses, the group, and to log out. So you can go to the Facebook group. You can just click on this and it'll scroll you to the courses. And so as this thing loads, then I'm going to have this roll up and have it stop like right here. Mm -hmm. Okay, or I could just click on courses and it'll roll us up. Actually, I need to pull that down a little bit. Uh, so like I said, this is not done yet. But um, how this would work, in fact, if I were to reload the screen, uh, reload the page, which I'm not going to, what we would only see at this point would be these five courses that I have set in here. None of this below here would be showing at this point. So okay. we just came into the page, it just loaded, it scrolled up to the top. So it's gonna scroll up to about right here. And then you're gonna click on one of these courses. And as you click on the course, it will change out what is the lessons down here. So we'll click on this mm -hmm. course. And now it scrolled us down the page. Now I'm not sure if I should, should I leave it up here or should I scroll it down? So here we are now in this course. And now maybe I even need a header in here that says, you know, yeah. course, course X, Y, Z, whatever it is. And then, um, so should I leave it like this or should I scroll it down and put like a course header like right here? 
Um, a couple thoughts. I would definitely scroll. I would make sure that the, you know, that's a slow scroll. So people understand that that's what's happening right. when they click on that. And then, yeah, some, I would have a bounding box or a borderline or something to make a clear distinction between those sections and then write a header or even like something over on the left to say that I'm now in this course, um, the course is offered course. Okay. So some sort of header up here. Um, mm -hmm but I want to still leave this on the screen so that people can go here. Okay. Well, I want to go back to this course now that I also have access to. I would instead, I would maybe have it be like, um, like if you scroll up, maybe a, almost like a, a subheader or something like that, a sub nav area that, uh, you know, like an arrow or something, you know what I mean? To say like back to courses or something along those oh, lines. Okay. All right. Um, so that's really like, interesting. So are you, are you using, is it like a membership site inside of a membership site? Uh, no, all this is, is these are images. Okay. Each one of these images represents a section inside of ClickFunnels. Okay. And so I could have coded it to, to go out and have it actually grab a hold of the section names and pull it in and do all that kind of stuff. But I said, well, why would I do that? Why not just put a picture, just put an image element in there, put an image into it. Obviously I just scraped these off the web somewhere. And so then somebody's going to know what that course is uh, in the upper left there, just like, you know, um, Catherine's images are pretty descriptive of what it is mm -hmm. you're going to get. Mm -hmm. um, but so you're going to know that you're going to click on it and then you're going to come down here and you're going to get all of the lessons inside of that section. But mm -hmm. then inside of each one of these lessons, you can have all kinds of content. Yeah. And I didn't, I, I didn't put any separators in here. I just built this out like two minutes before we got on the call just because of the different ways, you know, kind of similar to what Catherine had, um, where's her content here. Um, so what she had here is an image and some text and a video. And so I just wanted to kind of make it look like that. And so we got an image and some text and a video. And then I just flip flopped them for the next one. And then I did three across here. And then this one here is a video modal. So it'll just pop up. And um, so I just, through some content in here just to show it can look like anything you want. Now, again, also here, you can go full width on this. I, I'm not using the full width fu yeah. functionality. You could go definitely full width on just this section at the bottom. You could go full width on the whole thing. I don't think I'd go full width up here. Yeah. But what this part does here is no matter how many lessons you have built in, it pulls them all up automatically for you. Yeah. So you don't have to put these in here. It goes into the lessons section. It finds all the lessons and it puts them in here. The only awesome. thing you have to do is give it the images to associate with the, with the lessons. Yeah. That's awesome. And then it also puts down here. What is the, um, what is the name of that lesson? So obviously I just call them lesson one, two, three, you would call it whatever descriptive thing it is, or you don't have to put this in at all. You could just yeah. take out those lessons and just have it be images. Yeah. Because you could have all the text right in the images here. Now, again, we were talking earlier about the ADA. I think you'd have a real problem with ADA if you did not have this text element below it. Because yeah. a blind person ain't going to be able to see, you know. Well, a screen reader won't be able to do anything with it either. Yeah. No, I guess if you put in the, what is it, the ARIA text or whatever, or the alt text, a screen reader should then be able to pop that up on the image. Right. But yeah. in this case here, these are not actually images. So you would have to have the text below it. I, I think as, as I think of how I built this thing, these are not actually images. I mean, they're images in the background, but it's not an image element built okay. into ClickFunnels. The ones up top here, these are image elements. So you can put in your alt text and your ARIA text. Uh, I think it's ARIA text, whatever. I forget what it's called. Um, but you can put that in up here. But on these here, you really couldn't do that. Okay, got it. Yeah, so you would want to have the lesson below here if you're worried about ADA. So I don't, I don't know. Everybody, right. has, to, everybody has to figure that out on their own. Yes, um, good point. <laughs> but yeah, so that was it. I just looked at it and I just said, well, here, yeah, why not? Um, what I mean, what does a course have to look like? And so how you could also set this then is so if let's say we the first course here is free. Mm -hmm. And so everybody comes in here and they're going to have content access to this content, but then they come to the second course here when they click on it, instead of it showing this information, I can code that, that it says that if they don't have access to this to then have whatever pop up here, 
um, you know, a banner, a warning, a link to somewhere else, whatever it's going to be to say, okay, you want access to that? Great. Click on this and go here and buy it. Wow. So all that could be built right into this here and you could have multiple courses inside of one membership area. That's awesome. That definitely opens up the door to a lot of possibilities, Dan. That's exciting. Yeah. I have to play with it more, but I love it. Yeah, I love the I love the idea of it and the possibilities it opens up. Yeah, and again, it just uh it just auto it just auto pops everything once you put in the code. And yeah. uh and then the lesson will change out and it scrolls up when you change the lesson and all that stuff too. But again, I have to decide where do I want this to scroll up to? Uh, do I want to put in the course header here? You know, all that kind of stuff. But again, in the course header, it's not that terribly difficult because I'll actually name the section, whatever I want that course header to be. And then I'll just have it go out and grab that section title and just yeah. dump it in here. I might left justify it just to, you know, keep it in alignment with that lesson. And again, like maybe a, a bounding box, but yeah. Yeah, there has to be some sort of separator here if I'm going to do yeah. that. Yeah. 